Well, good morning. It's good to be with you again. I think the last time I was here, we were outside, and we were celebrating the installation of Paul Patrick as your new pastor. So it's really a joy to be back with you. Uh, last time I was at Ridgehaven, I pulled up to a closed gate, and I saw somebody about 100 yards off waving and running towards me, and it was Archie. Uh, so it's uh, wonderful to be here in a church that has been served uh, by these two pastors, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. Turning your Bibles to Zechariah chapter 3, and this morning we'll be looking at the first 10 verses, Je Zechariah chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Hear now the Word of God. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fires? Now Joshua was standing before the angel, clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. And I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord was standing by. And the angel of the Lord solemnly assured Joshua, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways and keep my charge, then you shall rule my house and have charge of my courts, and I will give you the right of access among those who are standing here. Hear now, O Joshua high priest, and your friends who sit before you, for they are men who are a sign. Behold, I will bring my servant the branch. For behold, on the stone that I have set before Joshua, on a single stone with seven eyes, I will engrave its inscription, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. And that day, declares the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbor to come under his vine and under his fig tree. Here is the reading of the Word of God. Let's pray together. Father, we ask that by your word and spirit this day, you would quicken our hearts to believe more fervently the gospel of grace and that you would strengthen us by that grace to live more wholeheartedly for you. For to you alone belongs all the glory and the honor and praise. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. On February 9th, 1709, Little Jackie, five years old, was awakened by smoke and the flames of fire that were beginning to engulf his house. He was on the second story and his brother and siblings, his mother and father, were able to escape the fire. But as the family gathered together outside in front of the burning house, they realized little Jackie was still inside. The father raced in, but as far as he could get was the front door. The house was beginning to be engulfed. And in tears, he came back out and he knelt on the ground and he committed his little boy to the Lord. But some neighbors saw little Jackie standing in the window on the second story. They formed a human ladder and they were able to save him. There was much rejoicing on the front lawn that day. 41 years later, on February the 9th, same day, 1750, this little boy, now in his mid-40s, remembered that it was on that very night and that very time in which he had been spared from the flames. He had been involved in a worship service at London's West Street Church. And he wrote in his diary, About 11 o'clock it came to my mind that this was the very day and very hour in which I was taken out of the flames. I stopped and gave a short account of God's providence that night. And the voice of praise and thanksgiving went up on high, and great was our rejoicing in the Lord. And 41 years after that recollection, little Jackie, now known as John, John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, wrote the epitaph that's on his tombstone, and it simply reads, Here lies the body of John Wesley, a brand plucked from the fire. No doubt the high priest Joshua would have had a similar sense of gratitude for the Lord because he was described as the same in our text in verse 2. Zechariah's 
people in the day of Zechariah, they had returned from captivity in Jerusalem. The temple was being rebuilt, but then after that the question was who would then perform the duties of worship in that temple? God had given that responsibility to the great high priest, and so here now is a vision. It's actually the fourth vision in Zechariah's prophecy. And right on cue, Satan interrupts. The accuser of the brethren challenges the vetting process of Joshua the high priest and deems him unworthy to serve in that position. So the question before us this morning is, well, then what hope do we have? If this was the best representative we could have had before the throne of God above, and he failed that vetting process, then what hope do we have of ever standing before that throne? Well, we see in this passage of Scripture before us that our sin is much more pervasive and heinous than we could ever begin to imagine. You know, we tend to try to sanitize things, everything, especially these days of COVID. There are hand sanitizer dispensers and disinfectant wipes everywhere, and thankfully masks are beginning to come off. But sometimes what we do is we come across a passage like this, and we pull out our, our spiritual Lysol, if we will, and we try to wipe away the sin that describes us, and we try to sanitize it with our human works of righteousness, but there's no way that we can do that. Our, our sin is so bad, there's nothing we can do to remove it. How bad is it? Well, here's our best representative, our best shot to stand before the Lord, Joshua, the high priest, and he miserably fails. In fact, at this moment, as he's standing before the Lord, Satan, the accuser, comes and he, he begins to challenge him. He says, what is that I see on the great high priest's garments? What is that that I, I smell? You see, we see in this passage of Scripture that Satan isn't exaggerating. Look at verse 3. Now Joshua is dressed in filthy clothes. The Hebrew word there for filthy is an an offensive word. It's a word that describes human waste. And here he is, standing before the holy, holy God, depicted as standing in the sin of, of refuse and human waste before the living God. And the Scriptures are reminding us in this fourth vision that that's us. That's what our sin is like before a holy Holy God, and if that offends you, cheer up. It gets worse. Not only does God describe our sin in such a heinous manner, He describes our righteousness in an equally offensive way. You remember from Isaiah chapter 64, all of our righteousness is what? It's His filthy rags. It's a different Hebrew word, but it is no less offensive. In the New Testament, describing His own acts of righteousness, Paul uses the word skabala. It's a word for dung. Here we are in our supposed self-righteousness before holy God, and God Himself says, you in your sin are offensive to me. Now, if this is Satan's assessment, and he only knows half the truth, how much more an omniscient, all-knowing God who knows every single thought and attitude and intention of your heart and my heart. Years ago, the British journalist Malcolm Muggeridge was working in India, and he left his residence one evening to go for a nearby swim in a river. And across the river, he saw a woman bathing, and up to that time, he had been faithful to his wife, but the raging current of the lust within his heart began to draw him towards that woman. And on that night, he had determined to cross the line of marital fidelity. And as he swam with the lust driving him in his heart, he finally arrived at the woman. But when he saw her, he was shocked. He said this, She was old and hideous. Her skin was wrinkled. And worst of all, she was a leper. She smiled at me with this toothless mask, and I thought, what a dirty, lecherous 
woman. But then it dawned on him. It was not the woman who was lecherous. It was his own heart. That's why God gives us this vision, this fourth vision in Jeremiah's prophecy of us standing before the throne of God in our filth and in our stench. Let me ask you this morning, have you seen the sinful, lecherous nature of your own heart? Have I seen that of my own heart? You see, until we do, we will live in self-righteous delusion and never run to a Savior who's offered before us. And so here's Joshua the high priest standing in filth from head to toe and just when you think that God would dismiss him as unfit for that service, God does something wonderful, something surprising. Rather than turning to Joshua, he turns to his accuser and he threatens him. He rebukes him. And in that moment, God promises something. God promises to remove our sin and to clothe us in robes of righteousness. As Satan is thundering his accusations, and by the way, he's correct. God thunders even louder. His voice of grace. Remove those garments. What a picture of the removal of our sin. Take them off, verse 4. And then he says, See, I have taken your sin away. All the filth, all the offensiveness, all the heinousness, all that stood against a holy God has been removed as far as the east is from the west. But not only does he do that, he clothes us in rich garments, robes of righteousness. And I will put, verse 4, rich garments on you. And then in verse 5, he puts a turban on his head. Now the, the priest wore a turban. Joshua's turban was also covered in the stench of his own sin. But God removes it and he puts a fresh turban on. And on the front of the turban of the high priest was a gold plaque that read, Holy unto the Lord. Now picture what's taking place here. Standing before the Lord of glory is Satan, pointing his bony accusatory finger at Joshua. And Satan is correct. All of the sin of which he's accusing Joshua of is true, and Joshua knows it. He's standing before the Lord covered from head to toe in his filth, and he has nothing to say. Yet in immeasurable mercy, in boundless love, in God-glorifying grace, God removes Joshua's sinful, soiled garments and He places on him robes of beautifully arrayed, clean, holy righteousness. So complete was God's cleansing that He not only declares Joshua forgiven, but holy unto the Lord and righteous. Now, I hope the application for us as Christians is obvious on this side of the cross. It's, it's hard to miss, isn't it, of what Christ has done. Listen what it says in verse 8. Listen, O high priest, and your associates seated before you who are signs of, who are symbolic of the things to come. In other words, this whole scene in the heavenly courts before the throne of God above is a symbol, it's a picture of what God will do for us. And notice in verse 8, through whom he will do it. I'm going to bring my servant, the branch. Now those two terms, servant and branch, would have been familiar to the ears of the Hebrew people for both Isaiah and Jeremiah remind us that the Messiah, the Christ to come, would be a suffering servant who would, serve, who would suffer in the place of his people. He would be a branch, one who had a minuscule start but who would explode in his ministry to great fruit to the Father's glory. My servant, the branch, is coming. The suffering servant. And one day we're told that he would in a single day take away the sins of his people. He's referred to as the stone with seven eyes. Seven eyes probably symbolizes the idea that he knows everything. He knows the depths of our hearts. 
but he's also the stone, the cornerstone, the capstone, the one who would be absolutely key in building a true temple for God, not of brick and mortar, but the people of God in whom he would redeem. So here's this picture of the stone who would build the temple of God, the great high priest who would come, who alone would be worthy to stand before the God on behalf of his people. And in that one historic day, he would wipe away all of our sins in a single day. On this side of the cross, it's hard to miss it, isn't it? What is this fourth vision of Zechariah all about? To whom is it pointing? It's precisely that this. God has decisively dealt with our sin once and for all through the person and work of Jesus Christ. All these designations in Zechariah are pointing to Him, the angel of the Lord, the servant, the branch, the stone are all pointing to Christ, even the great high priest's name, Joshua. It's Hebrew for Jesus, which means the Lord saves. And on the cross, Jesus did precisely what is prophesied here in Zechariah chapter 3, and He did it in a single day. On the cross, Jesus took upon Himself the guilt and sin of all of His people throughout all the ages, and He paid in full the penalty for our sin. He wiped that sin away in a single day, and He's building the true temple of God, a people of His own possession for His own dwelling and for His own glory. So what does all this have to do with you? What does it have to do with me? Those who do not yet recognize the offensiveness of their sin are indeed living in self-righteous delusion and will one day stand before the Lord Almighty and hear these words, Depart from me, for I am never knew you. But on the other hand, if we have recognized the heinousness of our sin and our desperate need of the Savior and in faith run to Jesus Christ, His cleansing blood has washed us. We cry out with Augustus Top Lady, foul I too the fountain fly. Wash me Savior or I die. Let me ask you this morning, have you been confronted with the reality of the heinousness, the grossness, the filthiness of the sin that dwells in your heart? And have you in faith run to that cleansing fountain, the person and work of Jesus Christ? Jesus' blood and righteousness is your only hope. Jesus' blood and righteousness is my only hope to ever stand before the throne of God above. I trust that if you have not put your trust and faith in Him, that you will do so today. But for those of you who have trusted in Jesus Christ, who cried out with Augustus Top Lady, foul, I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. There are tremendous benefits that flow from your union, our union, with faith in Jesus Christ. Zechariah mentions several in this passage before us. First, God in Christ completely removes and forgives our sin. Just as Joshua stood there in those filthy robes and they were removed, so your sin has been removed as far as the east is from the west. John promises us if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will purify us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The terrors of law and of God with me can have nothing to do. Why? My Savior's obedience and blood hide all of my transgressions from view. If you're trusting in Jesus Christ, God has decisively forgiven you of your sins. Second, just as the angel of the Lord didn't simply remove Joshua's filthy garments and leave him standing there in his birthday suit, but rather clothed him, so God also clothes you in Christ. When you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, He doesn't simply remove our sin, but now He covers us with what? Not with fig leaves that we sow for ourselves of self-righteousness. He clothes us in the righteousness of Jesus Christ Himself. 
J.C. Ryle has a wonderful word picture of this as he's dealing in his commentary with Jesus' baptism. You remember when you heard, he heard the voice from heaven booming? This is my son. With him I am well pleased. J.C. Ryle says this, Believers may rejoice in the thought that though in themselves sinful, yet in God's sight they are counted righteous. The Father regards them as members of His beloved, and He sees them with no spot for His Son's sake. He is well pleased. This is the doctrine of justification by faith alone. God declares you based on the righteousness of Jesus as righteous in His sight. For those of you who still long for the smile of God, who really think you've got to do more and do better in order for God to fully embrace you and love you, you need to understand what's going on in this passage. All the righteousness that God requires of you, He's provided for you by grace, through faith in His Son. He's forgiven us. He's removed that sin. He clothes us in His righteousness. And right now, at this moment, if you are in Christ, you are righteous in His sight. Third, because of Christ, we should have increased confidence to face our accuser. When Satan comes and points his bony accusatory finger in your face and says, how could you be a child of God? How could you be a Christian? knowing what you think and what you do in the privacy of your own hearts and your own homes, knowing the sin that you constantly pursue, how could you be a child of God? How do you respond to that? There's a wonderful picture in The Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan where Apollyon representing Satan, that nasty fire-breathing dragon, comes to Christian and he accuses him of unfaithfulness. And Christian asks the question, how in have I failed my Lord? How I've been unfaithful? And and, uh, Apollyon goes on and on and he talks about how you've forgotten your scriptures, how you have failed to obey, how you failed to worship as you ought. And he lists these failures. And then Christian says something remarkable, something every true Christian will say. All this is true and even more that you've left out. But I have a Savior who has died for me. That's how you face the the daggers and the accusations of Satan. You don't look to yourself and try to polish up your own self-righteousness. You look away from yourself and say, that's why I'm a Christian. That's how I will stand before the throne of God above because I have a Savior who has lived for me and who has died for me. Be thou my shield and hiding place that sheltered near thy side. I may my fierce accuser face and tell him thou hast died. Yet another benefit, fourth, for those who come to Christ in faith, life cannot remain the same. Look at verse 7. Thus says the Lord of hosts, if you will walk in my ways and keep my charge... There was now a charge upon Joshua's life, a call upon his life to walk in newness of life. And if you're a Christian, if your faith and trust is in Jesus Christ, there is a call from the Almighty upon your life and mine to walk in newness of life. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come motivated by the grace of God and the gospel, empowered now by the grace of God and the gospel. We long to live lives that mark a newness of life, walking in His ways. Fifth, we now have bold access to God Himself through Christ. Verse 7 continues, and I will give you the right of access among those who are standing here. Do you realize that access before God was almost unthinkable of the people at all of old? There was only one person, once a year, and only after offering sacrifice for their own sins that could approach God personally, and that was the great high priest. Only once a year. But now in the new covenant, Jesus has torn that curtain from top to bottom, and if you're trusting in Christ, you have bold access before God Himself 
every single second, every single moment of the day. There is no distance that separates you, no cloud that enshrides him, that you cannot come into his presence as his dearly loved child. We're reminded in Hebrews chapter 4, for we don't have a high priest, parentheses, like Joshua of old, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet was without sin. Therefore, do what? Approach the throne with boldness, draw near it with boldness, with confidence, because of Christ. And so in the hectic pace of life, in the difficulties of the days ahead, you, if you're in Christ, have direct access into the Holy of Holies, the very throne room of God Himself. And you have the ear of the King of Kings. And you not only have His ear, you have the heart of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords because of Christ. Six, there will be a profound sense of amazement and gratitude at the grace of God in the gospel of Jesus. Again in verse 2, you'll be like Joshua. I'm just a, a burning stump. I'm just a stick. But God reached in down in sovereign grace and he pulled me out. I'm but a burning brand snatched from the fire. Presbyterian pastor Robert Murray McShane put it in words this way, chosen not for good in me, Waken from the wrath to flee. Hidden in the Savior's side by the Spirit sanctified. Teach me, Lord, on earth to show by my love how much I owe. If you really understand, like John Wesley, that you are but a brand plucked from the fire, your life this week will be lived in gratitude to this God who reached in, took the fire upon himself in order to spare you from those flames. And finally, such a great salvation will increasingly become good news. Great news to the believer. When you hear good news, what's one of the first things you want to do? You've got to tell somebody. You send out the tweets, you send out the texts, you you get on Facebook, you start telling your neighbors and friends about what God has done for us in Christ. And I believe that's where this taking off the filthy garments and placing on the righteousness and making us right with the living God eventually leads the believer in Christ. This is good news, and I must tell my neighbors. Look at verse 10. Notice what it says. Here's this picture of the new covenant blessings. And that day, declares the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbor to come under his vine and under his fig tree. It is a picture of let me bring you in to the blessings that I have enjoyed in Christ. We just sang from Psalm 67. You know what Psalm 67 is about? Bless us, O God. Bless us. Why? So that we can be blessed? No. Lord, bless us that the nations, that our neighbors may know that you're a gracious God and merciful in Christ. You see, the believer who truly understands the gospel will never then again approach his neighbors with a self-righteous condescension. Because we'll see ourselves in their shoes. We're but a brand that's been plucked from the fire. We only have our hope of righteousness found not in ourselves, but in Christ. And the gospel strips away self-righteousness, which I believe is the key to reaching this community for Christ. What do I mean by that? Matt Chandler tells the story during his freshman year at college. He said, I sat next to a 26-year-old out-of-wedlock mother who was back in school trying to get her degree. And we had a lot of conversations about the grace and mercy of God. We had a lot of conversations about what Christ had accomplished on the cross for those who put their faith and trust in him. And several other Christian guys began to try to minister to her. He said, we'd even come over and we would babysit for her so that she could study. We began to get involved in conversations and meals about the person and work of Christ. And Matt said, one of my friends was going to be in town. He was a Christian. He was going to be with a band in a concert. And I thought, what a great opportunity to invite Kim to hear the gospel again. 
And so he invited her to a concert. He said she thought it was a concert. I knew better. Gospel is going to be shared. But after the band played, Matt said that the pastor stood up and he said, today I want to talk to you about sex. And he thought, "Uh uh-oh. Here I've got this unwed mother right next to me at what was supposed to be a concert and he wants to talk about sex. And he immediately said, I've got this rose. I want you, and he, he smelled it, and he, he felt it, and then he, he tossed in the audience, and he said, here, I, I want you to smell it, feel its texture, pass it on. There were about a thousand people gathered there that evening. And then he went on to what Matt said was probably the most horrific, worst handling of what sex is and isn't that he'd ever sat through. He said it was fear-mongering at best, And I'm thinking with with Kim right here beside me, what are you doing? What are you doing? And he went on and he railed and railed in anger. And then towards the end, his crescendo was, where's my rose? And finally a kid brought it up and gave it to him. And it was torn and tattered and wilted. And his crescendo of his talk was this. Who would want this rose and he tossed it on the ground and Matt said anger began to build up in my heart real I want to hurt you anger because that's the point of the gospel Jesus wants the rose that's why he came Jesus wants the rose. That's the gospel. That he who knew no sin became sin for us. That we might become the righteousness of God. That in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Oh my friends, have you seen yourself as Joshua on that day saw himself, covered in filth from head to toe in sin and in shame, utterly unworthy to stand before the throne of God above. But have you also seen through the eyes of faith our Savior? Have you now through Him seen yourself as a brand plucked from the fires of hell and as a once rejected rose deeply loved by the Father? Such is the hope of those whose hope is in Jesus' blood and righteousness. And my friends, if you are in Christ, that is your assurance, that is your hope that one day you will stand before the throne of of God above. And even as Satan points his accusatory, filthy finger in your face, you'll be able to look and there by your side was our great defense, our great high priest, Jesus himself, who speaks on your behalf. So look to him. And with confidence one day you will stand before the throne of God above. Let's pray together. O Christ, we give you thanks and we give you praise that you took upon yourself the fires of hell that we might be snatched from its flames. That you, O Christ, though you were without sin, were bruised and broken and tattered and torn in order that we might be the rose accepted and dearly loved by the Father. And we thank you, O Christ, that because even now you intercede on our behalf, we can with confidence in that day before us stand before that great throne in absolute, utter confidence in your righteousness and your blood and your defense on our behalf. For this we give you thanks, we give you praise. In Jesus' name, Amen.